This session is looking ahead uh, with a the theme of faith-inspired action to end AIDS. So uh, thank you to, to Sandy Thurman for uh, kicking us off with three great stories of uh, Desmond Tutu, Andrew Young, and Coretta Scott King, and um, to uh, Mark for leading, Mark uh, Legon for leading us through a wonderful panel. And I think we're really lucky to have such, such a group here. We, um, I'm John O'Quick, I'm a family physician uh, who decided early on, I decided I liked um, having whole countries as patients and so have uh, ra raised my uh, family and, and worked in, in Pakistan, Kenya, Geneva and a number of places with the World Health Organization and Management Sciences for Health. And um, as part of this, I've since the 1990s been involved in AIDS glo uh, globally and, and at the country level. I'd like to, before introducing the panel, uh, just really thank our co-sponsors. I think that uh, Catherine Marshall and, and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs really jumped at the opportunity to bring, uh, pull together a meeting like this. And it's as much the, the networking among the panelists and others as, as anything that really is of value. And uh, the Georgetown University Global Health Institute, Maeve McCain was really helpful. Um, and Claudia Winkler, who really kind of made the thing happen. So thank you to the, to the co-sponsors, also the International Shinto Foundation and the World Face Dialogue. And uh, um, I want to ask you a question. Where were you in September of 1999? Taking you back. Where AIDS was after um, ne two de nearly two decades, it had, in the three previous years, emptying the hospitals in Europe and North America with effective, highly effective antiretroviral therapy, we went from AIDS being the number one cause of hospitalization to AIDS becoming a chronic disease through the availability of antiretroviral therapy. It was still a death sentence in the South with less than 1% of the people uh, who needed treatment on treatment. At $12,000 per person per year, with no money, no proven systems, it was a death sentence. And if you had described to the global health community in the year 1999 what actually existed a decade later in 2009, or now, 20 years later, where we've, got, we've gone from less than 50,000 on treatment uh, in poor countries to 17 million on treatment, where we had no program for, for or orphans and vulnerable children, where we had really, really uh, progressing but, but uh, weak uh, prevention programs. No, we didn't even know how to do maternal, uh, prevent maternal to child, child transmission in 1999. So, um, and many, if you, as I say, if you described what actually existed a decade later, they would have said impossible, not in the world we know. But it happened, and it happened because people imagined what seemed to be impossible, and they went ahead and did it. As, as Nelson Mandela said, everything seems impossible until it's done. So this panel is, is really looking or, over the next decade and looking at faith-inspired action to end AIDS as a, as a public health threat, as a global health threat. We will still have, as we heard from Jesse and others, uh, we will still have millions of people living with HIV. But taking it down in terms of, of the, the, the spread and preventing a resurgence, that's really what, what this is about. So we're, we're very fortunate to, uh, to have a great panel today. And let me quickly introduce the panel. Uh, sitting next to me is Mercy um, Niwe. She's the Global Faith Engagement Lead at the World Bank. And in that role, she uh, focuses on uh, collaboration and partnership with faith-based organizations. She's also a senior economist and international development expert working for 20 years in this area. And formerly in World Vision, so she's provided leadership and technical assistance on the ground in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. So welcome, Mercy. Sitting next to Mercy is uh, Rebecca Blachley, the director of the Episcopal Church Office of Government Relations. 
where she represents the Episcopal Church to policymakers in Washington, including White House, Congress, uh, Episcopal institutions, uh, visiting ecumenical community. Um, and really interesting background, she's held prominent positions in uh, Africa for the Office of Religion and Global Affairs in the State Department, uh, for the US Command in Stuttgart, Germany, at the Pentagon, and uh, she's dealt with a variety of, of issues of um, religious dynamics and the role of religious leaders, and also done field work and research in these areas. So, well, I mean, she's a recipient of the Harvard uh, Humanitarian Initiative Grant and a DOD Medal for uh, Exceptional Public Service. Sitting next to her is <laughs> um, Jenny, uh, Jenny Dyer. She's the founder of the 2030 Collaborative, an organization that's dedicated to advocating for a better world, pretty, pretty broad. Um, but they, they are the home to two very important faith-based efforts. One is the Faith-Based Coalition for the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And the other is the Faith-Based Coalition for Nutrition, which she directs. She has uh, served as the executive director for Senator Bill Frist's uh, charity, Hope for the, for the Healing Hands. For those of you who uh, are of the, of the younger side in this field, uh, I think we could say Senator Frist is the congressional father, uh, godfather of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief for PEPFAR. He really was a, a major mover in that area. Uh, Jenny also teaches at Vanderbilt in uh, both a medical school and the School of Divinity and has contributed to several books and has one coming out that she's uh, co-compiled coming out this fall. Has it come out already? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, The End of Hunger, Renewed Hope for Feeding the World. And maybe you can be back here for book talk at Georgetown, possibly. Uh, and uh, sitting next to uh, Jenny is Francesco Marico, and she's the HIV coordinator at the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance. And that, that's a group that engages faith-based organizations for multiple transitions. She's a, a lawyer by training uh, who uh, specializes in children's rights and has also worked for Caritas International and comes from uh, the northern part of Italy between the most beautiful lake in the world, Como, and Milan. So sitting next to Francesca is Dave uh, Barstow. He's the founder of Impact Africa, a Christian nonprofit dedicated to helping pastors in Southern, Af Southern Africa deal with stigma and HIV. Um, he, he actually comes from the field of artificial intelligence, which, believe it or not, existed uh, 40 years ago. And um, at a Christian conference a little over a decade ago, Bono inspired him to give up an academic and, uh, and consulting life to become uh, an AIDS activist. activist. So, and he's really worked in the area of getting stigma on the agenda with the U.S. State Department and uh, working with the World Council of Churches on that. And he is the author of the book, which people have been waving around and will come back to. So let me start with Mercy. Um, coming from your perspective and um, building on some of your experience in, in your home country of Kenya, Kenya you, you, you describe yourself as having a passion for building the capacity of faith-based organizations. What is what is engaging the faith-based community and building that capacity look like in practice? Thank you so much. And I would like to firstly thank you to Catherine and the Buckley Center for having me here today uh, on behalf of the bank. And correction, I'm originally from Uganda, not oh, Kenya. Though, oh, I'm sorry. Though I love I, Kenya. Sorry. <laughs> I, I spent four years living in Kenya and raised our, our girls there. So it's, uh, it's just, OK, my apologies. So the Ugandan the city of Seven Hills. <laughs> Yes, so the bank recognizes um, the need to actually work with faith actors to advance development goals. So um, I'm new in this role and I'm excited coming in as an economist and seeing how can we engage faith actors to actually contribute to eradicating extreme poverty. So we view faith actors as stakeholders that will be able to reach masses, especially in enhancing behavior change, influencing social norms, 
and especially enhancing governance and accountability. So when we come and say how are we building capacity with faith actors, we are thinking about those three issues. How can we build their capacity? Because they are already really working with governments. They are already enhancing behavior change and social norms. The bank is engaging faith actors in currently three themes or four themes to say. One is human capital, the human capital project, where we are investing more in people. Second, on resilience and adaptability. Third, which is going to also be so key on HIV is fragility and fragility, conflict and violence. And then women and youth, which is stemming so much from the human capital project. We view HIV AIDS as a cross-cutting theme in all these. We are engaging faith actors in advancing the human capital you know, project. And the human capital project is about investing more in people, investing in a healthy population, educated population with social inclusion. We cannot have a healthy population if we do not tackle HIV and AIDS. So globally, the good news is we've seen prevalence rates going down for vertical transmissions, but I'm seated among experts who have all the statistics. You agree that we are seeing prevalence rates going up. Growing up in Uganda in, the, uh, you know, in 1980, for example, we had prevalence rates of, of 880,000 people, and among those, 44,000 died that year. Right now, it's 1.8 million people with HIV, and only 20,000 died in 2018, showing that, yes, people are taking their ARVs, but why is the count going up of people who are living with HIV? And how, how can the faith community come in to work with governments? The Ugandan government used the ABC policy, and many of you could have heard of that. And it was really abstinence not before marriage and condoms, the C was for condoms. And I remember growing up in school, every first day, every assembly, we had to sing the HIV anthem. We had an HIV anthem, and it was AIDS will kill those who do not care. You have to change your lifestyle today, and we sang it every day. What changed was faith leaders actually coming and doing public testing for everyone to see. And it really encouraged people in their congregations to start doing testing. That way, vertical transmission started coming down. Because if you knew your status as a mother, as a pregnant woman, you knew how to take care of your child. How can the faith community come in to advance such, uh, such policies that can actually change from seeing the prevalence rates going up. One, we act, it, it will be very good for faith actors to work in partnership. One, with the private sector, with governments, with multilaterals. How can we work in partnership to ensure that these rates are going down? What happened in Uganda was governments worked with the faith communities, education system, the whole public system, all the schools sang the same anthem every Monday and Friday. And we grew up so scared of HIV AIDS. Unfortunately, that fear now has gone away because people think I have drugs so I can live any lifestyle that I want. How can we go back to morally affect the societies that we are living in? Three goals that have been set. Zero new infections. We are seeing infections going up in areas of fragility and conflict. And Catherine, you alluded to that in the previous panel. We cannot ignore that. How can the faith community come in in that area? Zero deaths. There is a lot that has happened, decrease the deaths. But how can we work to suppress you know, the virus by encouraging people to consistently take, take their medication, consistently? It's recently I met a friend of ours who has lived with HIV AIDS for years and he's just coming to talk about it. And uh, the first thing I asked, are you taking your medication? And he said, no. And this is something that we have to start one person at a time, especially in the faith communities. Youth clubs in Southern Africa, many of the churches have set up youth clubs where some, like Swazi, Swazi land, they can't talk about Swatini now. They can't publicly talk about someone's status. But in youth clubs, they are coming up with creative ways 
of encouraging this message to go around, text messaging, WhatsApp, did you take your medication today? This, we have to think out of the box. We cannot continue doing business as usual if we want to see us reach the last mile, especially in the key population. The youth, we are seeing adolescents getting on the rise, getting HIV AIDS. How can the faith community work with their youth groups to make sure this message is going forward? Or even work with governments on advocacy. For example, in some countries, Southern Africa, ARVs are free, but in some countries they are still expensive to afford. We can't continue to work the way we did before, just putting it in a clinic. If it's an adolescent who is coming from school and clinics are already closed after school, how will they access the ARVs? If the community, the faith community work together, can we actually be part of, of even advocating for either subsidized prices or even free ARVs? We, not only are we, we want access, but also the mode of delivery. You know, I, I was talking to someone in South Africa, truck drivers are the ones who are the key population <laughs> that is catching HIV. But they've been creative ways of border points putting you know, modes of supply for these truck drivers because they won't have time to go to a clinic to buy. you know. So the faith community in the past, we've lived in a place of judging. So zero stigma. How so, can so we're going to come to, the, to looking forward in, in, uh, in the next round here. Where we'll engage it how we define what we want to exist in 2030. I think you've given us a great picture of, of what, what you... Uh, uh, want to be doing now and and um, and uh, yes, and what the issues the are, what the yeah, challenges the world, are. Yeah, the challenges I've, I've shared with the challenges, yeah. and I know everyone else will be talking about those. The World Bank might have decreased funding for for HIV AIDS because of the work that has been done with Global Fund and PEPFAR, but what they're increasing funding on is the research. So the faith community calling upon you to build a body of evidence on what is the role of faith when it comes to HIV AIDS. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A, and thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, Rebecca, you've studied and written about and been directly engaged in, the, in Washington in the field on religious dynamics. Uh, what do we do? We, we had some conversation before in the previous session about the different uh, stakeholder groups not talking to each other, not working together. How, how do you make that happen? Um, thank you, and great question. And just again, thanks to my fellow panelists and the previous panel, to Catherine and, and the Berkeley Center for hosting this. Um, you know, I think on some level we do see it happening. Um, we know that at the grassroots level there are is really good work that's going on. I heard from colleagues of mine who work at Episcopal Relief and Development about the partnerships they have with Anglican churches, with ministries of health, to be able to have public-private partnerships, um, to be able to do the range of um, both prevention, treatment, and, and care that are needed. Um, Francesca may speak more about the, the work that the WCC is doing, that the Anglican Communion Office has been partnering on, about creating a, a roadmap for migrants and um, living with HIV. Um, so there's certainly things still happening, again, I think as folks know. Um, but there has been a, other issues that have also um, generated more press and more attention. And I think we've alluded to this before, but the generational piece I think is really key. And I, it's not just that the older leaders are ready to retire and pass on. I think it's really that folks younger than I don't remember the mm. AIDS crisis. I mean, it, it's, it's not an issue that they were raised with. I mean, so there's a sense that we need to shift the conversation to really help talk through what that arc looked like. Um, folks now are very captivated with you know, climate change, migration, human trafficking. You ask folks in their 20s what they're passionate about. It's not that they're necessarily apathetic. It's just that other issues have really taken prominence. So I think to show um, that this is one component, a critical component of global health, um, looking more broadly at the challenges that, that we face that are very complex, and this is a key piece of it, and we need to make sure that the progress isn't reversed. So I think there's certainly a generational piece that will... Um, enable religious communities, governments, um, civil society actors, and others to work together. Um, sustaining attention is another really key piece. Again, this has been going on for a long time, as others in the room know better than I. 
Um, so it's easy to think, okay, well, you know, we did that. Let's let's move on. For religious communities, I think um, that the theological justification is the same <laughs> for why we need to do this work. So we need to keep coming back to that. That there's not this doesn't mean because we've been you know fighting this fight for decades um, that it's time to move on to something else. That theologically we are still called to serve those. And, and as we heard um, in the previous panel, not just the sick and dying, but to help those who are living to live well, um, to educate. Um, and let, let me ask you a question uh, related to uh, to this issue of what what motive the loss of interest. Mm -hmm. You've got, and I would encourage you if you think there's a total loss of interest, which I'm not saying we were thinking, but. If you go to their website, and you'll, you'll find the, the statement of the coalition scores, scores of religious leaders from all over the country who, who have signed on in support of the Global Fund. Can you reflect a little bit on um, wh why they did that? How come they're still engaged? And w w what can we take from that about, uh, and whether there's some younger generation people there uh, which I suspect, given the pastoral profile, there are some younger ones coming up. Can you say a little bit about how that really happened and how they're taking that? The, the, all those people behind that that um, the statement from the faith-based coalition to support HDB and malaria, uh, the Global Fund? I think, yeah, Mark would be the better person to, to speak to the, the um, great work that's being done around um, Global Fund issues and, and Friends of the Global Fight. Um, but, you know, I... There still is energy, again, and in particular among those who've been working on this um, for decades. Um, but I think that, so the challenge isn't that there's not um, energy, but again, that there's other issues that also end up taking um, prominence on it. So to be able to continue to build on um, the case that we've been making around both service provision, education, reducing stigma, modeling through testing, um, the various ways that religious leaders and communities can be engaged, but then also to continue the advocacy piece. And I think that's really critical. And that's something that in the Episcopal Church Office of Government Relations, we're trying very hard to do, to work with Anglican communion partners, um, you know, at the parish, diocesan, and province level, um, to say that religious communities can have a faith, of, uh, have a have a voice at the table in advocacy, and that they can go to their governments and say that the ministries of health need to take the right steps. Finally, I just say on the domestic side um, that there's an opportunity for um, there's historic bipartisan support on this issue, which I think is very important to remind folks of if they're hesitant to get engaged because many advocacy issues, as we know right now, are highly polarizing. There has been such strong support on both sides um, that religious communities who may be hesitant to, to jump into something that's seen as political, I think they can get involved in advocating for PEPFAR, in, the, in fighting for the Global Fund, and ensuring that we're doing all we can as religious communities to push the government to take steps as well as doing things within our own communities. Okay. Uh, I want a big, huge apology. <laughs> I, a I ask uh, Rebecca about Jenny's uh, Jenny's coalition, so you can answer that question. I really apologize for that. <laughs> I just wanted to get them to get to know each other. To... You're just keeping us on our toes. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to keep me on my toes. Uh, no, um, yeah. So I'll I'll speak to that to yeah. the faith based coalition. Um, so thank you. Um, for you know, giving me this opportunity to speak. I think this is a very timely and important forum. We do stand at the crossroads of how the U.S. will choose to play a role in this epidemic of HIV and AIDS domestically and globally right now. So as background, I have been educating and activating faith leaders on the issue of HIV and AIDS since 2001. Um, I helped direct a conference at Vanderbilt called AIDS in Africa, Science and Religion. I, was, uh, I worked with Thomas Nelson um, as a compiler of a book, um, uh, The Awake Project, uh, Uniting Against the African AIDS Crisis. And I served as the National Faith Outreach Director um, at the Data Foundation, which became the one campaign where um, Bono uh, co-founded. And after that, I did run Senator Fress, um, Hope Through Healing Hands, for the last decade. Um, and in all that, doing continued work of advocacy with the faith community, um, and um, much of that time spent on HIV and AIDS. Um, 
So I've had the privilege of working with these faith leaders to raise awareness for the HIV and AIDS epidemic and to rally advocacy and support for funding for both PEPFAR and the Global Fund. And I have the honor of continuing this work with many even today. Um, I created the 2030 Collaborative almost a year ago to open up the possibilities of working with a variety of nonprofits and foundations to double down on achieving the, the, uh, the various uh, sustainable development goals by 2030. My area of expertise academically and experientially is working with the faith community with transparency and education to lead on global health and development issues like HIV and AIDS, TB and malaria, but also family planning, nutrition, clean water, and child survival. Um, I wanted the opportunity to, to provide guidance to other groups who want to learn the best techniques of how to communicate and collaborate, particularly with right of center denominations um, and leaders, namely evangelicals. In doing so, I've been thrilled to work alongside the uh, Friends of the Global Fight with Mark on a weekly basis to provide the outreach needed to faith leaders nationwide to affect policy and politics for robust funding for the Global Fund, namely during this year of replenishment. As a part of this work, we recently created the Faith-Based Coalition for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Given the administration's current recommendation for reducing global and domestic funding for HIV and AIDS at this critical juncture, it was imperative this year to pull out all the stops to make sure that Congress understands the sustained support from the faith community, particularly from those on the right side of the aisle. We need forward-looking champions on the Hill who understand where we've been and where we're going. We need faith and political leaders to take a stand for this funding because they understand both the moral imperative and the economic imperative. And we need strong advocates who will fight the fight, finish the race, and keep the faith, in the words of St. Paul. And we are succeeding. For instance, we're standing on the verge of the first increased appropriations in both houses of Congress for the Global Fund in six years. Mm. I know. That's a huge yay. I am lucky enough to hold the relationship with hundreds of faith leaders who began this journey almost 20 years ago and many before that, um, and have persevered through these three administrations with unceasing advocacy through offering signatures for letters, emails, phone calls, and th many visits to their members of Congress. My role is to continue to educate them and provide opportunities, what Sandy was talking about kind of as an intermediary now um, to provide uh, at, during strategic moments during the political year to lend their voice and their support. But of course, my coalition isn't enough. It's just one group of faith leaders, albeit various across various sectors as pastors, artists, athletes, speakers, and nonprofit leaders, but we need so many more. In today's political climate, we need unity across the spectrum from left to right, and we need joined hands from grassroots to grass tops and we need a renewed zeal to finish what we started if we're going to look back in 2030 with pride. This, for me, will be my own life's work, and I wanna tell my grandchildren I was part of this American movement of advocacy to win the war against the global HIV and AIDS pandemic, but we will need a fresh calling and a spirit of unity as a religious response if we are to succeed. Thank you. We'll go over to uh, Dave Barstow. Um, congratulations on um, what may be a, a, a publication first. Normally you have the book and then the movie. In Dave's case, he had the trailer for a movie that's never been made, uh, a 2030 movie on how we lose the war, which became the basis for the book. So Dave, why did you write the book? Yeah, the, the idea went back to um, the first time I learned about the, uh, the Fast Track Initiative. And I saw a chart that showed... Which is, for those that I'm don't sorry, know, yeah, you, Fast Track? The Fast Track, from, from UNAIDS. Uh, and that's, uh, it was, came out in 2015. Uh, and it, it was the, the goal of ending the epidemic as a public health threat by 2030. And the 90-90-90, which probably all of you know what that means, by 2020. And part of the charts to talk about the initiative showed um, the number of new infections increasing under some scenarios and the number of deaths increasing under some scenarios. And I was probably naive, but I didn't think that was, you know, that couldn't happen. We were gonna make progress and just, it might be slow progress or fast progress. We could actually come back. And, and then 
that feeling was reinforced at the, at the 2016 Durban conference when um, Francesca organized a, an interfaith pre-conference. And a lot of us talked about, um, you know, the, the, at that time there was a sense of real optimism in 2016. And our discussions were about how to deal with the social issues and the importance. We, our feeling was that if we didn't deal with, social, with the social issues, we wouldn't get to the 2030 goals. And that religion was key to achieving those, uh, or to addressing the social drivers. And that was what made me ask, what would it feel like to be in 2030 and look back, just like you're wondering, what would it be like to look back and think we blew it? How could we have thrown away all the progress we made? I mean, a depressing feeling, right? So the thought was that if we could somehow dramatize that feeling, that would help us make the decisions now so we don't have to have the feeling. Uh, and that wasn't what led to making this, that first I thought we could make a movie. And so we made the trailer, and it's a documentary that hope will never be made, but it's set in the year 2030 at an AIDS conference. People looking back, wondering how we screwed up. How do we lose the war against AIDS? Well, everybody said, that's terribly depressing. How about talking about the other side of winning the war? <laughs> so I said, all right, well, that's too much for a movie. So we'll make it a book with these two sides, winning and losing. Um, and the, the difference between those two futures is really pretty stark. I'll just mention one statistic. In the losing future, there are 8.6 more, million more dead people than there are in the winning future. So 8.6 million is the difference. Um, and, but the important thing isn't that number. The important thing is what are the things that happened in each of these scenarios that led to one or the other? What are the actions and the decisions that were made between now and 2020, 21, 22 that led to one future or the other? Uh, and um, some of those decisions, the, you know, if I look at the winning future, some of the decisions seemed like they'd be pretty simple. Um, fund, fully fund the global fund. You know, that's a simple one. It was good. Um, and there were other decisions um, that, or other actions that um, relied on religious, uh, the religious communities, faith communities. Uh, um, and um, two that I'll mention, one is um, strong advocacy in 2019, like right now, uh, and also the work of local faith communities to address stigma over the course, and that's a longer thing, it's not something that's gonna to happen today, but over the course of the decade, successfully addressing stigma. Um, and I'd like to read a chapter, not a chapter, sorry, a <laughs> paragraph <laughs> of, um, and this is um, by, by Dr. Um, Zhang Ji Yu, a Chinese doctor who's head of the World Health Organization in 2030. And she says, there was a great march at the San Francisco conference in 2020 with all of those prominent, <laughs> religious leaders. I'm not a particularly religious person, but that march was really inspiring. And for the first time, I really believed that we would be able to deal with the social issues because religion would unquestionably be on our side. Then a few years later, that belief was confirmed when we started getting data about what so many local faith communities were doing. And all of that came out at about the same time we finally crossed the incidence prevalence threshold 0.03 in 2023. And at that point, I knew, we all knew, that we would be ultimately win, that we wouldn't have to worry about being on a panel about how, losing the war against AIDS. Uh, and Sandy, in the winning future, 20, the PEPFAR is closed down in 2028, so you need to work on your, <laughs> work on your resume. <laughs> oh, God. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Francesca, what, um, as a lead for the um, HIV, as the HIV campaign coordinator, uh, for the uh, Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance, what um, what do you what are some of the encouraging things you've been dealing with groups internationally everywhere with incredible patients and really trying to bring people together around AIDS? What are some of the encouraging things that you've seen, and what are some of the challenges you've seen? And, and maybe weigh a little bit more on the encouraging. We've heard a lot of challenges in the last hour and a half. Yeah, I'm going to be the positive voice. Um, and so just for those who do not know, um, the World Council of Churches Ecumenical Advocacy Alliance is a very broad ecumenical network of um, service delivery churches and Christian development organization. 
um, which came together in, in the year 2000 because what we felt it was that faith communities and uh, religious groups were really good at um, delivering services for HIV, but we were terrible at speaking together about HIV in a common voice. And so we came together and we decided to work through a campaign methodology. Um, and our work on advocacy includes capacity building, awareness raising, um, policy engagement, uh, and really a lot of trainings uh, with religious leaders. But uh, in, the year to, in the year 2015, we became part of the structure of the World Council of Churches. So we are now even broader than what we were before. We are not a program of the World Council, but um, we are an initiative because our constitu constituency includes the Catholic, Evangelical, and Orthodox as well. So it's uh, 500 million Christians around the world. Um, so in terms of some of the engaging work that we have been doing, uh, the organization has a motto, which is the more we can speak and act together, greater our impact for justice will be. And we are still not good at the speaking together, but we have I realized that by identifying joint action to address issues related to HIV and AIDS, we were much better. And so I give you some of these uh, examples of the work we have been doing. And one is um, a methodology which is called the framework for dialogue between religious leaders and people living with HIV. Mainly what we do, we use the stigma index studies from the global network of people living with HIV, which measure the stigma uh, um, experienced by people living with HIV in countries. We analyze it with a fate angle. And then we bring together in a format of a long process and dialogue, religious leaders, uh, people living with HIV, UN agencies, uh, government representatives. And we do this at national or local level. And what I have to do is together identify joint action to address stigma and discrimination. And so by this action and by the uh, effort to identify the joint action, we have been really capable of bringing this multi-faith multi and different groups together. The outcome is very different depending on the countries and the uh, HIV contest. So I can give you some example. In, in Ethiopia, for instance, we developed, um, the Orthodox Turks developed sermon guides on prevention of, um, to mother, of mother to child transmission and gender-based violence. While in uh, Kenya, the focus was really around gender-based violence and youth. Uh, and engaging religious leaders in uh, promoting targeted testing in faith communities. And in Malawi, we had religious leaders who became champions against homophobia, or we developed a working um, policy for um, people living with HIV in churches, which did not exist before. Uh, so really diverse. The other piece is what... Uh, before you go on to that, I want to be sure... No, really, I want to be sure people understand how important that exercise was, because... The PEPFAR is the biggest public health program, treatment program, program in, in disease-focused program in history. One of the keys to its success, which was very controversial at the beginning, was a real focus on measurability and numbers. And what we have proven over and over again in global health, what get, gets measured gets done. So stigma has been a recurrent issue. And probably a lot of the people who are, I would venture to say the majority of people either don't, don't even know they're stigmatizing, or if they know, get uncomfortable about it, they actually don't know how to change. And this is where there was measures, and then they got people together uh, on a focus of saying, here are the measures, here's, here's what the situation is. We're not gonna argue about the facts. Here's the situation. And then you talk about what you can do together. You have a joint task. You're not debating with each other about our theology versus yours. You're saying, we have this joint problem. And working together to solve a joint problem is what develops the understanding and the trust. It's amazing how differently somebody is when you're sitting next to them. Uh, and so that's a re and we might cut some of the, <laughs> have to cut some of the other examples. But um, I, I think, that gives us a picture of a conversation we're going to actually, do, I want to get into the, <laughs> that leads us to a conversation I'd like us to have. Um, do you want to get a couple of other short ones in and then have that conversation? or You know that with me, short is impossible. I'll try. Uh, 
uh, it's just, just to add that uh, this uh, framework for dialogue process has been implemented in several countries around the world. And now we launched two weeks ago in Ukraine the dialogue process with different faiths uh, involved. Um, and uh, it's really engaging with injecting drug users and prisoners as well. Uh, so we are really looking forward to the outcomes of the dialogue there. And as I said, it's interfaith, which is really important. And it's dialogue. And it come, we always come out with very concrete actions, which sometimes are very simple, but um, really engage different groups together. In terms of uh, other example of actions that have brought people together, um, I think I would um, say something about our leading by example religious leaders and HIV testing campaign, um, which is um, a campaign that was launched in 2016 to um, promote um, testing in faith communities. And we really realized that at the time, half of the people living with HIV didn't know their status. And so we really um, reflected on what it can be the role of faith and religious uh, groups to promote testing and linkage to services in, in faith communities. And so we all know that uh, a lot of people do not know about HIV and HIV testing. They do not have access to the information or they do not have access to the testing. But a, a lot of limitation and barrier is caused by stigma and discrimination. So what we thought was, if we are religious leaders lead, lead by example, and as was Mercy was saying before, and they have an HIV test, and we are not promoting public testing, but the religious leader is, in, is getting tested for HIV, and this way, uh, it commits also to share information about HIV in the faith communities. Um, it needs uh, to be trained and informed about the new methodologies around testing. Um, and we have been doing this uh, as an interfaith campaign again. So we have Muslim leaders, uh, Jewish leaders, different Christian. Um, at the beginning, uh, so I am Catholic, so I talk a lot about the Catholics. But at the beginning, it was very difficult to convince some of the Catholic groups because the Catholic, uh, re the religious leaders were telling me, well, but we do not engage in sex. And, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and it was really, but the, what, the reason, okay, but so the reason we are doing this is because we want to create stigma free, free communities. So you're giving an example, you are doing this in support of others. You're in, encouraging others to be tested for HIV. Now we are really working on new messaging because what changed from 2016 is that we have 9.4 million people who still need to know their status, much less than before. So it needs to be more targeted. The messaging in the faith community should not increase um, stigma and discrimination, but they really are meant to engage and encourage people to come uh, to the faith community and to feel welcome and then accompanied uh, in the faith community. So we are working on that including with the Anglican communion. Um, and uh, I can continue for okay. three no, hours. No, no, that's okay. I will stop. Well, you get another bite at the apple. So let, let's take Dave's, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to warn the panel, I'm going to put the question, that, whatever questions we talked about, I'm going to put it in a different way. But, but looking ahead to 2030, um, what's your own sense and I'm not going you, you're not going to answer first there. What's your own sense about whether we're going to win, given all you know, and given all that we've heard in the last uh, hour, uh, well, we've been here two hours, what, what's your prediction? Um, and I won't ask you to do a, a, um, a debate, raise your hand, we'll get, you can talk. Um, but what's your prediction? Do you think we're going to win the war on AIDS? In other words, we're going to see a steady, steady decrease in the incidence, or are we going to lose the, the war in the sense of we're going to see a resurgence, um, that we haven't been able to tackle the problem of, of um, the increasing prevalence and preponderance um, of new cases in women and the youth bulge and all. So I think maybe I'll go from one end to the other. Um, or do you want to? Yeah, go, go ahead, Mercy. Are we going to win or lose? I have faith. We are going. To <laughs> <laughs> I have faith in faith that we are going to win. Uh, I think the battle is going to be won in us raising the conversation again, the way it was long time ago, especially with the new generation. But 
if organizations are coming together, like recently I know um, more than 1.8 million was given as additional support to research into finding the, you know, the uh, cure for HIV, for example, from the World Bank. So if we are raising awareness, many of the donors, not only to the recipients or the people, the vulnerable communities we are working with, but even to the donor community, because there is a lot of competition for the small pie of funding that is there, and HIV is coming on the back burner with all the urgent development needs right now. Okay. So, so I have faith and hope that as we continue this voice of awareness that is coming from the faith leaders and faith actors like you, donors are going to be more motivated about this, but also the communities, the young, the youth, the key populations that are affected mainly with this will also start living a better life. Rebecca, win or lose? You're asking a panel on faith-based issues if we have hope or not, so yes. As a, <laughs> I, I but yeah. <laughs> so yeah, as, as an But, but God helps Christian. them who help themselves, so we need to, yeah. No, I, mean, I, I think what's encouraging is that we have the tools to do it if we can get the political will and support. And that's encouraging. I don't think that's the case um, for some other complex challenges we face. So, so that is a big piece of it. Um, what I hope we're able to overcome is just a resistance globally to partnerships and working in support of multilateral institutions and collaborations broadly. I mean, I think that we know that partnerships, we've been speaking about faith community partnerships, but really it's all different kinds of partnerships um, that will need to be robust and flourishing for um, this effort to be successful. So I'm hopeful that there's a, a change back to hope in our ability to come together, to work together, and to address the, the big challenges we face. Jenny, win or lose? Um, if we were, if we, if I am being honest, I think we don't know. Um, I think we, I think Sandy put it well in her opening comments. I think the hardest is yet to come. Um, we have a youth bulge in Africa. Um, we need more funding, um, than we've ever asked for before. If we're going to, uh, really play a role in controlling this epidemic in terms of the U S funding and then globally. Um, and I think that the religious right and those who have put um, President Trump into office are um, as adamant as ever in, um, in not helping with social stigma. I think that's in the US and I think it's around the world. Um, so I think we are going to have to double down on our education and our awareness raising on um, the public health crisis at hand if we're gonna succeed, but we're also going to have to double down on our efforts in reducing st social stigma and the importance of social stigma, particularly amongst the right, uh, um, the right of center um, in the U.S. and around the world. And it's going to be a challenge. Francesca? So I really liked uh, your comment about uh, the last, um, it, it, that it's going to be harder now, and I agree, it's like, uh, I don't know if you have children, but when we, I drive with them on vacation and we drive for 10 hours to go to southern Italy and the last three hours are eternal. And I really feel that now we are <laughs> going to have this <laughs> eternal um, challenges. <laughs> but um, I, the AIDS 2020 conference in July next year as, as a team of resilience, and I think that it is the best <laughs> team that was ever identified because it's, thanks to our resilience in addressing HIV that we are where we are now. And it's the joint collaboration of several organizations um, that has been uh, helping us to be where we are. So I have faith that if we work together um, and if we identify concrete, simple joint action for address the challenges, then we will be able to end AIDS. That's an if we do, then yeah, then win. Okay, Dave? Yeah. Um, several people have asked me, they see the cover of the book that says lost, won. What do you think is going to happen? And between the two scenarios, in all honesty, I think we're going to lose, if just between those two. Um, and uh, let me tell you how the winning scenario came out. Because uh, I had to identify some things that could happen between now and 2030 that would lead to winning. And some of them seemed quite plausible, like funding for the Global Fund. 
I mean, if, if we actually incre or increase PEP, man, wouldn't that be great? And so that's plausible. But there were some things that were less plausible. <laughs> and there was um, the, uh, and most of them had to do with religion and dealing with the social drivers uh, like stigma. Uh, the, um, one of the things that I, I identify in the book is a wonderful religious, strong religious presence at the AIDS conference in San Francisco in 2020. And when I wrote that passage of the book, I asked myself, come on, Dave, get serious. Could that really happen? And the reason we're here, I'm here at least, is to prove me wrong. Because I think it can be. It's an if. If we do it, we can. But we have to do it. OK, so um, let's open the floor to some questions. Oh, Jenny, did you want to come in on that? Yeah. You're trying to get rid of OK. Yeah, go ahead, please. And Dave? Yeah. yeah. Well, we're a small group, but however you're comfortable. <laughs> we're not formal. Hi, my name is Zulema Iboa. I'm a public policy fellow at AMFAR currently. And my question is kind of related a little bit to the youth. We heard it in the previous panel and the current panel about how the millennials or Gen Z aren't really involved. And I kind of want to preface this with, I was raised in a Catholic home. Um, I've been very involved with HIV and AIDS since I lived in Uganda actually for three months doing HIV research. And so my question is, you know, we talk about millennials, but you don't really talk about them in the faith context. You kind of separate them from the faith context. And we have seen throughout the years that there has been a distrust from with the rise of social media or whatever you want to say is a, a purpose to this rise of distrust, where the you don't see as many people going to congregations. Doesn't mean we're not spiritual. It's just we're not going to church. So there, it's a, it's a two prong question. So it's like, how are you separating? us from faith, first of all, and then second of all, saying that we're not involved when I know social media activists, I know people who are out there giving like prep in mobilization clinics, like, yes, I may not have been alive when my friends and family were dying, but I do have migrant family workers who are HIV positive and do not have the resources to access it. So yes, I am very involved and care much about this issue. Dave? Hi, uh, Thank you. Dave Robinson, previous panelist. Um, I'd like to ask Mercy and then uh, Jenny maybe, talk about um, conflict, fragile conflict zones around the world. Um, Eastern DRC right now, where the Ebola crisis, it's 10th in the DRC, is, is not getting under control. And a local Congolese uh, anthropologist is telling me that he's not getting the funding, the soft, soft power funding for the Ebola crisis in the DRC is not flowing where it needs to go. So is that back to what lessons are we learning about the difficulty in conflict zones battling another virus like Ebola? What does that teach us about what needs to be done going into this next decade with conflict, fragile contexts as the most difficult and hardest place for development act, uh, progress? Okay. So two, two very different questions, um, engaging the youth and, it's, it's, um, and then fragile states. Let's, let's, well, let's take the fragile states because we've got a couple of people identified and then youth. Thanks, Dave. So fragile, uh, fragile states, we are identifying that as the greatest, as we say that we are investing more in people we are seeing for us to win the battle against poverty, we have to pay attention to fragile states. 50% of the countries that were not fragile that just 20 years ago are now all fragile. And the biggest issues we find there, you know, let it be refugee camps, rape cases, women being abused, youth being abused, we are seeing that on the rise. We have to come up with a comprehensive health system a comprehensive way of tackling, so for example, Ebola. We didn't learn the lessons from West Africa, where the faith community really worked so hard to combat the deaths to zero. And one of the previous panelists, you also mentioned it, that the world focuses more on the people who are dying, and we forget the component of research. 
when the youth come in, you know, social media, if you just said one out of three people have HIV AIDS and they are dying, that will go on social media. If we have that research, so that's why the bank is really focusing right now on research, engaging faith actors. I know World Vision, for example, through Channels of Hope, there's a lot of evidence going on. We have to have evidence-based advocacy. So okay. for us to raise that, especially in the fragile context, we have to build on the lessons we have learned from what has happened in the past. Why have privilege rates for HIV gone up in many of these countries? And what are we doing about it? Jenny, any thoughts on liberating the funding? I actually, no, I think you, I think you hit it. Okay, nice. good. Well, so the whole question about engaging youth, because we got two we got two dynamics that are, that are that are affecting well, th three things with the youth that are of concern. It's a growing population. We talk about the youth bul bulge who are at risk. Um, they are less aware of of AIDS uh, because it has become le less. It's become less common, and, and they're, they're not, as we've heard, they're not getting those those songs in school and all, uh, and they're less engaged in in organized uh, faith communities. So that's a the, that's a triple header. Uh, any thoughts on that, Francesca? I, I actually would or, like to comment Jen? on one thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't have the statistics. I wish I, I used to know them for like 2008, 2009. I wish I had the statistics in front of me on the youth in your in the generation um, millennials on their con rated concerns, the percentages of concerns for say climate change versus AIDS for versus the various. That's something I need to research. Um, I wanted to speak to more broadly, um, and I think Sandy raised it earlier and others that the storytelling is just so important. It's not just with the youth. This is across generations. Um, I recently was in an office with uh, Representative John Rutherford, who's in Florida, who um, is a Republican um, representative. He's a baby boomer generation. He had never heard of PEPFAR. He was newly elected to office, and I had the opportunity to share with him what is PEPFAR, which his party put through through the Bush administration. So I just say that to say that this, the continued storytelling across generations, across the population, is just we have to be sustained and um, persistent in that. Um, so I think that uh, even when we talk about youth and their engagement, we should not generalize. Um, the situation in um, the US uh, and Europe might is completely different than um, the situation in, in Africa, for instance, where youth are still very much part and engage with fate. Um, and um, we have, um, we really believe in the importance of engaging young people and children, even children, um, to talk about and to understand about HIV, to be informed about HIV. So what we did is um, we have launched in uh, August last year a children and youth letter writing action where children uh, and it's actually from 11 to 24, so it's a very broad definition of, of children. Um, so children, adolescents, and young people are encouraged to write letters to the ministries of health, of finance, of education, um, and to the first lady in their countries um, er around issues related to HIV, and in particular is around stigma and discrimination, for instance, in the school. It's about uh, having access to testing and treatment for children and adolescents. So children, um, so this, this uh, children letter writing action is used by religious leaders and teachers in religious schools. And uh, this way we empower young people to be engaged in advocacy work on HIV. Um, and for instance, in Kenya, we have been working with um, the in, uh, interfaith network of religious leaders living with HIV and engaged 13 congregations and seven religious schools. And we had beautiful and very uh, moving letters uh, written by the children and the adolescent. And these letters have been brought by the children to the ministries of health, education, and the first lady. And they are quite powerful. But so it's something that can be done in many countries and we should encourage doing. And this also promoted a lot of, and a strong linkage between re the religious leaders, uh, the teachers in the religious schools and, and the children. Um, and the other piece is, uh, 
we are often organize um, trainings uh, of religious leaders on um, issues related to HIV. And when we do discuss about children and adolescent issues, we make sure that the children and adolescents are present. Uh, and last year, in, on an occasion of Universal Children's Day, we organized trainings with under 40 religious leaders in Kenya. And there were children and adolescents as well. And then we organized a march with, with them. And we asked the children and adolescents to pre prepare messages and banners uh, for the march. And this is, again, very powerful because they were those who came out uh, with what was important for them to share about HIV. So it's something that is happening in many parts of the world, but it's true and I recognize that engaging young people in the work of faith uh, in relation to HIV is extremely difficult in Europe. <laughs> Yeah, Catherine. Uh. I wanted to ask Dave uh, this picture of 2020, San Francisco, this phalanx of religious leaders. Uh, who do you have in mind? What, what, who, who do you want to have there? What, what's, what's the scene? So you want my fantasy? <laughs> no, I want your fantasy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Pope, Dalai Lama, Desmond Tutu, Michael Curry, you know, go down a list like that. Um, so the most did, prominent. Yeah, I mean, to me, one of the important things is um, a public awareness raising of, of advocacy that religion really is on, on the right side of this. Uh, and the more prominent people that we can get saying that, the more public awareness we'll get about the involvement in religion solving the problem. And I, you know, I, I've been to a lot of these AIDS conferences and it's always been a frustration to me that the, in the march, the big public march, the conference has one, the number of religious leaders who are participating in the march is always disappointingly small. The first one I went to was in Vienna and there were like, I don't know if people were there, but there were, there were like 15 sort of religious oriented people in a march of several thousand people. And to me, that was just wrong. And the, the religious presence should have been much more prominent, much stronger in a very visible public way. The other thing that I, that I would uh, say on that, because I think it's a great question, is to find those people who are, back to the question about social media, who, for, who, who there's already a recognition, who are, who are known people, uh, who different generations will respond to, who are people of faith and who are HIV positive, who can basically say, as we heard yesterday, you know, I've, I've been HIV, I'm not me, but I'm quoting yesterday, HIV positive for the last, you know, 15 years, whatever, and um, my, my faith has helped me to deal with it, and, you know, we, we got, you know, I think we need different, Different. I agree with you. Need, we need the, the, the top leaders, but um, any other, are there other? We got time for one or two more questions, because I, I think we're on an important issue about what is the strategy for visibility and currency and getting people attached in a personal way. Hi. Yes. Yeah. I guess my question is kind of related to that. Um, my question is about um, if any of you guys could provide specific insights into engaging LGBTQ communities and having conversations about sex, sex that's not heterosexual, when it's really difficult to have those kinds of conversations within faith-based organizations. Yeah, yeah. and I'll refer to a couple of the examples yesterday of leaders from that community who are really clear and really articulate and really engaging, yeah. So um, first of all, um, we, uh, as an organization, we are paired through a um, HIV strategy group, which is our advisory group. And as a member of this group, we have member of the LGBTQI community um, and um, who are religious leaders, uh, who are either living with HIV or not, but they are part of this community. Um, talking, um, <laughs> the talking piece, as I said before, is the difficult part. But the acting together piece is what works well. And we have great example of religious leaders that who are doing, and I hope Mike is going to say more about this. But um, so we have great example of religious leaders who really want to engage um, 
in activities. And the framework for dialogue is also used to um, open up the discussion around um, issues related uh, to sexual orientation as well. Um, and so it works when it's um, contextualized. In, in, it works when we have this action um, together that is identified. It doesn't work if it's just remain a philosophical discussion about what is what I think and what you think, because we're not going to end up to any solution this way. But we do have several examples. And we have, as I mentioned, the network of religious leaders living with HIV was several members who are religious leaders living with HIV and a member of the LGBTQI community. And I don't know if Mike wants to add, he's the expert. <laughs> no, I, I do um, think that uh, there are a lot of opportunities for us to engage. And we have to continue to find uh, platforms where we uh, center the voices of those with lived experience. That when we create a space where people are safe, safe to be present and safe to offer their voice, both in being in a community of that kind of safety as well as going back to their own communities so that uh, what they share and how they share isn't then a reason for them or their families to become uh, victims of stigma and shame uh, and, the, and the consequences of that in their communities. We have the opportunity then to build a coalition, a powerful coalition, uh, to uh, make an enormous difference in uh, HIV and many other things. I do think it will be the, the biggest challenge that we have ever uh, done. And there are a number of reasons for doing that. Stigma is a huge reason because that's present. Uh, and because of the recent uh, resurgence of nationalistic ideologies that perpetuate stigma is also another reason that makes stigma something that's going to continue to be very difficult to address. But because in the United States and in some other parts of the world, healthcare is a commodity. It is traded. It is part of the marketplace. And having sick people is an important part of driving profits for corporations that profit off of sick people. And I think that we can't um, put our heads in the sand about the difference that makes and how they influence policies and how they influence access to healthcare. It will take the strength of a, an important and powerful movement, people who are jolted out of their complacency, to do this. But it's not only just the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry. It's also industries that affect climate and climate change. And that will also be a huge, have a huge impact, not only on HIV, but on other health issues. And that will impact our ability to eradicate HIV and other diseases. So it's a huge complex of issues that we have to face. And that's one of the reasons I think it's going to be a huge thing. But as a faith leader, I always have hope. I mean, my scriptures tell me that even a remnant can make a huge difference. And I think that we have to continue to trust that if there's a group of people who are willing to get together and work on it, there's always hope. And even when there is silence, the stones themselves can start to sing. And so that is the, the faith that I have. And I'm grateful for gatherings like this where we have the opportunity to work together because I know that it can happen. But there are many faith affirming, faith communities that are affirming of people of different sexual orientations and gender identities. Uh, and I think it's important for us to uh, invest uh, in the capacity of those organizations and networks to help us leverage that aspect of, of hope uh, for ending HIV. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, did you have a point? And then I think we'll offer one. And Catherine, do we hand back to someone for the Close. closing? OK. Uh, I'll just offer a, uh, having asked people to only ask a question, I'll just make a quick comment. The, the, <laughs> ov the overall uh, image of the book and your you know, slight pessimism that the, the unfortunate result rather than the better result might be more likely, we should think about that mobilization and the key role uh, across faith communities. Um, we've talked a good bit about 
uh, the importance of cultivating a new generation of faith leaders, either of the cloth or more generally. Um, but I do think we need to remember that special role of the faith community, people of faith, and younger people of faith on the ground for those who face stigma. They will be crucial, and we need to mobilize. We need to get the resources. That's my day job. But we need to really think on the ground of those younger people of faith who will do the work for those who are most hated, most ignored, um, most marginalized um, in, you know, in some uncomfortable groups for some faith communities. Um, because to end the AIDS epidemic, we need to reach them all. Thank you. So I'm going to... I promised the pa the panelists uh, a final bite at each a final bite at the apple a short bite and then we'll hand over to Maeve McKean to to take us uh, to the end. Uh, so let me where do we want to let me let me start at that that didn't come on down. So Dave. Okay. Well, I I would like just like to propose a specific goal for religious involvement in the um, HIV response by 2030, and that's that more than 50% of the population that worship regularly, worship at a faith community that is actively fighting against stigma. So that means that if we take this 84% number, that means that uh, you know, of the population that, that worship, 42% of the population worship at a place that actively fights stigma, and less than 25% worship at a place that promotes stigma. So we do better on fighting stigma than we do on promoting it. And that's a specific goal. And at 2020, let's announce that goal, announce commitments from a number of religious institutions saying, yeah, we're gonna help get to that goal. We can have a measurement framework based on national standards that could be set by religious groups in different countries and a well-funded research program to evaluate that framework, say, in three or four different countries. Okay. Francesca. So one is linked to this is about uh, creating competent churches and faith communities to address HIV, which means that to me we need to work more in terms of uh, building our ability and capacity to measure the impact of all the intervention that we have. Um, I was at a meeting in WHO a few weeks ago, and one of the comments made by a US person was uh, faith intervention are no interventions. And I was very offended, but uh, I think he was right in the sense that often we do a great job, but we are not as good as others to measure the impact of, of what we are doing. And so we need to build this capacity. Thank you. And the second piece is around AIDS 2020. <clears throat> and it's, I believe, a really an opportunity to come together in a uh, coordinated way as faith communities and faith groups um, to celebrate the uh, great work that has been done uh, in the past 30 years by uh, faith-based organization, recognizing also our mistakes. Um, but it's an opportunity especially to re-engage faith uh, uh, groups in, uh, in HIV. Uh, and it's also an opportunity to build again the capacity of churches and groups. So we do have organized eight interfaith pre-conferences at the International AIDS Conference, and we're gonna organize an interfaith pre-conference also at AIDS 2020. And it's really my call to join forces, uh, those who are interested to be part of the planning and then to be present at the conference in, in, in San Francisco, Oakland in 2020. July 2020, Oakland. Fourth and fifth of July. Jenny? Um, two things, uh, as I was coming over here, I was reminded or thought of Walter um, Brueggemann's prophetic imagination, the notion of prophetic imagination. So I'd say we need a calling for more Dave Barstow's um, pro prophetic imaginations, moral imagination on how we can come together as one, a we, a unity. The second thing is I think we're going to have to have a lot of courage to work across the aisles during this moment of political divide and religious divide and how we can actually shape a common voice together, and that's going to be difficult, um, and we need both. Rebecca? 
Yeah, just to, I think, echo the really important and powerful comments that, that we've heard today, um, in particular that the road is long and also that we can get there even if the last part's the hardest, and just a thanks for encouraging us to do this 10-year look ahead and to um, take the time to come together to assess um, what is needed. And in this era of many crises, to be able to take a look ahead, do strategic planning, and um, ask ourselves as the faith community, what is our unique, powerful, prophetic, and evidence-based voice and contribution? You said it all. <laughs> Two things that I would really like or would envision for us to have. One is a body of research. Let's document the lessons, not just document them, but tell the stories to the younger generation and to even the people who are starting to forget. The second one is one of the pieces that I touched on earlier, how the faith community can hold governments accountable, accountable to the resources, but also accountable to make sure policies are designed for the vulnerable people. Because many governments are focused on things that are bigger than investing in people. So how can we hold governments accountable to investing more in their populations, that they have a healthy population, educated population on how they can take care of their bodies, but more so, so that even within the faith communities themselves, you are accountable to all the activities that you're creating with safe spaces. So governance and accountability. Thank you. Let me close this panel with um, a couple of things that we know and one thing that um, that I uh, that I believe based on all the conversation. First of all, we know that ending AIDS is a public threat, is do a public health threat is doable. We have the tools and the countries that are already and cities in this country that are already on the way. So we know it's doable. We know it's affordable. We have, we have a good sense of the cost of it, not a very good sense, and it's a pittance compared to the cost of not ending it, and that's really clear, clearly documented. And um, the third thing is that it's hugely beneficial, uh, particularly to the groups that we've heard. It's beneficial to the next generation. It's beneficial particularly to women. It's beneficial to the LGBT community. And, um, and the, and the, the, the uh, the fourth is that we have lots of really good examples of things that do work, things that, that have engaged uh, faith communities in, in, uh, in addressing stigma, and so that we, we, we actually have things that, that evidence of things that work. What I believe is that we don't yet, and yet's the big word, have a collective strategy that's strong enough and powerful enough to do what needs to be done, what we know can be done. So that, I think, is the challenge that, that this morning has laid out for us. <laughs> Susan Hillis, I, can't, I, I learned uh, never to say no to somebody in a uniform. Do you want to say something? Yes, and I have not said anything. Oh, OK. So I, I really uh, wanted to mention this concept that I think is a key to what we have that we're not thinking enough about, and it's called relationship capital. And so, like, if you think of faith communities, one of the shocking things that we're seeing in Zambia is unprecedented yield of, of HIV testing that is based on relationship capital. And what I mean by that is a clinic that was having only, like, 36, a large one in Lusaka, like 36 new cases a month, they decided we know where the people are and we know we have churches where the people are and we know have people in those churches where the people are that know them and knows who's at risk, we're going to them. And so they've gone from 36 cases a month to 500 new cases a month, simply using the relationship capital that people of faith have. And you ask those kinds of questions that are stigmatizing to many people. Do you have multiple sex partners? Do you have sex when you're drunk? You know, all of those things that you get asked at a clinic. Well, instead of that, they're asked, they know who's having marriage problems, who has someone that just moved out, who has someone that's bereaved or dying or sick in their family, who's always going to those healing services and will never go to a doctor. But simply by the relationship capital that they have, 
they are finding the missing in unprecedented numbers. And we have like seven other countries wanting to learn from the model. So just this concept that is really our, something that, you, that other groups don't have that we have, and I feel like we don't see it. And for the millennials, we're so glad you're here. <laughs> and um, I want to mention to you that like you really have this on social media in ways that like people in my generation don't have it nearly as much and it is and um we really have not harnessed it and we need people like you all to help figure out how to harness it because it has as its essence this same thing relationship capital thank you okay Maeve, over to you and i think we can just hang here to uh, avoid any dis disruption of move people moving around I'll just stand, okay. just okay. stand here to just say thank you to everyone. What a wonderful morning. Um, there are so many interesting parts of the conversation um, and so many wonderful things to move forward on. Um, I, I really just, one of the things that I wrote down about is that we really want public advocacy that religion is on the right side of HIV. I really, I really like that and I really think that we came together and, you know, talked honestly about about those strengths. Um, I, I really, what you just said, I, I was I put down sort of as one of the strengths that engagement with the commu community, that we all, you know, within the faith community, when I have to figure out how I'm supposed to talk about that um, um, accurately, um, it, it is our relationships and it is that trust and, and that does exist and, and that feeling that you're supposed to be serving the more, more vulnerable, that you're not supposed to be um, stigmatizing people and we you know that all comes from the faith and the belief that you're 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 supposed to be part of something bigger um, and that doesn't mean that within that there there aren't weaknesses and challenges um, including you know it might be that the youth are not as engaged or not as engaged in the leadership roles and that there isn't necessarily a feeling of unity because the history of faith and religion is one of division and and how do you overcome that um, and I think we have such great examples of of, you know, like you said, that we actually know how the faith community is supposed to engage in stigma. We just need to make sure that we get the word out and th that communication piece. And maybe it's using Facebook a little bit better, um, which is hard for, um, you know, our generational pieces. Um, and then I think um, I, everyone who knows me knows that I am very focused and concrete and want to know what the next steps are. And I, I really, on that, um, I think we came out with really two concrete next steps, which is one, um, that research agenda um, and pulling together what do, what do we know that's researched and needs to just, again, need, needs um, a bigger research or, or needs to be communicated and what are those gaps and, and coming together with that um, and obviously Georgetown with the Berkeley Center and the Global Health Initiative is really excited um, for that. And then what is the strategy for collective action um, that brings together um, the diversity, you know, both of those in the room and those um, who we work with. Um, because we do need, um, a, we, we know the path forward if we don't do anything, um, but we really do not path forward when we do the right thing. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone again for coming um, today. Um, and this is a, a continuing dialogue, and so we will, we will um, talk to you more as we go forward um, and see you all in... Um, uh, Berkeley <laughs> in July 2020. Thank you.